Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Here's a little zombie takeout I tossed off recently in the Caribbean. What's up? Welcome to Zombie Takeout, the B Moving Cult Movie Show. I'm John. And I'm Scotto. And before we get to this week's movie, just a little something we f- forgot about. Well, I, I forgot about last week. It was in my bloody notes. I skipped over it. Um, uh, Bodo tweeted at us a little bit before we came back asking, maybe you guys should switch your movie to Contagion if you haven't done that. Yeah, you probably already have. But anyway, miss you guys. Hope to hear you guys. Stay safe. Um, Sorry, Bodo, but I'm going to have to say a big fuck no to that. <laughs> and he left us a really like sweet voicemail too that uh honestly uh, i it, it i it it brought me to tears honestly oh, wow. hearing it it was just uh we love you too bodo mm-hmm. and, and thanks so much for everything and uh yeah, yeah just listening uh, to us and giving us feedback is is cool enough oh, yeah by the way, haven't heard from you for a while. Hope you're okay. Um, tweet yeah. at us. Let us know you're okay. Stay safe, man. Yeah. Um, but with Contagion, um, and a lot of people are watching it uh, nowadays. And if you're into it, if that's your thing, by all means, enjoy. I um, think it might we're be... We're kind of living it. <laughs> well, a lot of people are, are watching it now because of that. And if you want to do that, by all means, rock on. But it's I the think same would... reason why I didn't really watch The Sopranos. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it would kind of be in bad taste to review it. Um, also I have OCD, like legit o- diagnosed OCD and I'm a bit of a hypochondriac. So I really need to stay away from movies like that. Um, yeah. I can't watch that or outbreak or anything like that. Um, so we will never be reviewing movies like that. Um, also this I is think the they pro- actually filmed contagion parts of contagion where my wife works. Oh, wow. Yes. Um, there's a few kinds of movies we will never review outbreak contagion movies like that. Um, I'm morbidly arachnophobic, so I really can't do anything with, like, giant spiders or a lot of spiders. So no eight-legged freaks, no arachnophobia. And I hate to include this one because it is absolutely in our wheelhouse more than just about anything else. But human centipede. Uh, you know, any sort of mutilation yeah. movie is just not our thing. That's why we didn't do the walrus movie also. Right, yeah, yeah. But, but human centipede, I got creeped out reading this plot summary. Like I think we were all like in, in favor of, of Tusk, the Wallace yeah, movie because it's Kevin Smith. And until we found out, it was oh no no he he mutilates him into yeah, it's, a Wallace it's full on body armor, armor. right? Yeah, so not that our thing. Like, wow, that's um that's unpleasant. No, I think we're gonna pass on that. Sorry, Kevin. And and since I did briefly touch on on you know, current events, uh, I do want to take a moment since we forgot to last week to thank all of the essential workers who have to be out there doing their jobs, you know, outside oh, of man. their houses right now. Um, of course, all of the medical professionals, um, truck drivers, but uh, um, convenience store workers, supermarket workers, gas station attendants, um, anyone else I'm not thinking of offhand. Um, if you have to be out there doing your job right now outside of your house, thank you. Yeah, people that are running the deliveries. That, yeah, delivery uh, people. I've got I have one just, today and two tomorrow, or I should be remembering delivery people too. Bolstered um, my liquor cabinet up. <laughs> <laughs> I won't be buying any wine for a while because I have to sign for it. I know they do that. The FedEx has that. You know, they'll sign it for you thing, but I still don't. I don't know. I want to. Yeah, liquor. It yeah, I I actually had to get my wallet for the first time in a couple of weeks. <laughs> just get my ID, and I was like, "What the fuck is this?" You know, obviously they won't just leave it by the door. So I'm I'm thinking I'm gonna yeah. go drive for a while until all this passes. Anyway, and without any further ado, on to this week's movie, which is from 1983, Monty Python's The Meaning of Life. This is our Terry Jones tribute, and of course that brings us to the impromptu plot summary. Sponsored by the Law of Averages. Even the greats have to fail eventually. And also brought to you by the machine that goes ping. We we have no idea what function it serves, Mm. but accept no substitutes. Mm -hmm. Of course. All right. So we pretty much have an hour and a half version of the old Flying Circus show here. It is a long, (laughs) expensive Flying Circus episode. (laughs) 
<laughs> it's um, it, 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 we we begin with a um, I guess a short presentation. Um, the the Crimson Assurance or the Crimson Permanent Assurance. I just I think we'd always refer to it as the Crimson Assurance. Yeah, I something. always said Crimson Assurance. I completely forgot about the permanent part. Right, and uh, man, did they have a crystal ball or what? I mean, mm. corporate raiders were a, a thing. It was the early 80s. It was the yuppie era. But nobody really talked about it in the mainstream, at least, mm. until like, oh, a good six years later, you know, mm-hmm. or four years later after this. The crash happened in 87, and that's when corporate raiders and junk bonds really right. came into the mainstream lexicon. If you look at, I looked at the, the Wikipedia article on corporate raiders, there is nothing in their references that predates 85. Wow. And so here they are in doing this thing in 83 about corporate raiders <laughs> and, and using all of the correct terminology, of course, mm-hmm. that to us, of course, means nothing because we went through the late 80s. Right. But to know that this was here before, it's just it's mind-blowing. Yeah. And, um, and I'll just say now the best part of the movie. And so it's um, it's it's this uh, absurd thing where it's the you know they they're pirate ships in a building you know corporate buildings and of course they're literally raiding other businesses mm. uh, and then of course that brings us to the main feature and it's I, I don't know they split it up into six parts but isn't it really just birth. Uh, the stuff in between and then death yeah, yeah. I guess you know. Well, of course, you get birth, and uh, it has this satire on uh, the medical profession of all things, too. It just how for-profit medicine and just how people up top are just so disconnected with everything else. And and uh, while doing my research about this, I found out that Graham Chapman was a doctor. Oh, that's right. He graduated he medical school. He was. My God. And uh, <laughs> so uh, they, they start off with that, and then they – I'm trying to get over where they go to next in birth. Oh, then they go into, of course, birth control and, mm-hmm. the, and Irish, the Catholics. The Irish yes, Catholics. The, Cath- the Catholics versus the Roman the Catholics. Sorry. And uh, this uh, great musical number in there. The best musical ever. <laughs> and um, – yeah, it is. It is tough that they they went off with one of their their well, best musical numbers that right. Their up front. best. I'm, I was gonna say I said the best, but I don't know. There are some. We we've, we've seen some competitors. Well, I say one of the few great musical numbers. Right. I mean, it's hard to top the stuff they've done in the past, which is the problem of this movie. They're competing mm-hmm. against themselves. Yeah. And how do you top? Always look up the bright side of life. Oh well, yeah. Which, by the way, I just saw something where a lonely tugboat went through the Thames uh, blasting that <laughs> <laughs> just on its own just because we we live in the weirdest time possible but anyway um, life's a pile go, of shit when you think of it life's a laugh and that's the joke it's true yeah, I know it's fucking genius so <laughs> you go from that to um they pretty they they do a crit- criticism of religion indirectly about how it it is pretty much fetish fetishizing God. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, this other song about you know how great he is and how low we are and just um, the genuflecting. I guess they rip everyone apart in this. Oh yeah, nobody's safe in this. They hold I mean, n- they hold nothing back in this movie. They they are really this is them going out the door and they knew it. Mm-hmm. So they were just flipping. As yeah. many people <laughs> as they really went out the door. So uh, I think that's a pretty much enough of birth. They, oh, it yeah. goes to the, the school. Yeah, yeah. The the somebody someone I think a criticism of course hits it on the head saying the least erotic sex scene yeah. mm-hmm. in all of cinematic history. I had a bit of a thing for Patricia Quinn until I saw this movie. Oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, just the matter of factness of the, you know, it's a classic. And this was only like six years after Rocky Horror. 
No, no, yeah. eight years. Was it? Well, oh yeah, it's right. The 75 movie was seventy five, yeah. right? So only eight years. Hmm. And uh, <laughs> so, um, so then it goes this and, and uh, this brutal rugby scene mm-hmm. uh, where just these kids, of course, are getting pretty much the shit beaten out of them from all directions. Which, if it's not the greatest summary of School. adolescence, <laughs> yeah. let's tell you the truth, they hit the nail on the head. Yeah. Um, they revisit the war, uh, the military, of course, um, a few skits that are very similar to early Python skits. Um, the, the drill sergeant, they've done a few drill sergeant skits in, mm-hmm. in original Python, if my memory's correct. But of course this one, uh, goes off in a different direction from that. And then the war itself, <laughs> like for PC types, probably the most shocking uh, segment in this mm. whole uh, movie, yeah. actually. <laughs> well, not the war they start with, but the, the scene with the leg and all of that, yeah. Oh, the the Zulu. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because they start off with like a World War One thing. Oh, right, right. I forgot about the World War One skit, which, I mean, once you've done the cannibalism skit, which was also World yeah. War One. You, I mean, it is funny the kind of the premise of arguing about going away presents and cakes and whatnot. But I'm given our current circumstances, I'm just waiting for someone to say, "How long is it?" <laughs> but they've already done the cannibalism thing right. in That's World War the, One. That was the Castaways, wasn't it? How long is it? And Gammy Leg and all that. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that was there was also World War One. Oh, okay. Were, I'm thinking of a different cannibalism sketch then. Yeah, they were in a bunker, or they were in a trench in World War One, mm. and yeah, stop this cannibalism. Oh. Um. <laughs> but yeah, then they transitioned to the war against the Zulus, and there was a bit about how England needs to own the world, which is great. <laughs> uh, and then I think, wait a minute, I think now, and then we get to hold on. This is the middle of the plot summary. Yes. Um, we, uh, where is the fish? Where is the fish? <laughs> wow. And I feel like making a Primus reference, but. <laughs> right, because it was very private. Primus took they a, borrowed a that lot heavily. of that. Oh my God. The elephant and everything. The, oh the guy my with God. Joan's character with the arms. Yeah. They took that direct. I think it's Tommy the Cat. <laughs> I think it's the Tommy the Cat video that's directly referenced in. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the middle of the film, the middle of the plot summary, uh, which which bridges to middle age, mm-hmm. uh, which of course isn't nearly as interesting as all the early stuff. But um, <laughs> I'm trying to remember now. We we go with the Americans for we're death first, or do we go to the restaurant first? It's the restaurant first because it's middle age. Um, oh, and and right. that goes into organ transplants and the galaxy right. song. Holy shit. So yeah, they, they, <laughs> they, they, um, wow. Organ, yeah. Live organ transplants almost went too dark for me. Oh, but, but we're actually, we're mixing the review with the summary. Um, yeah. After that, we have the return of the crimson assurance very, very briefly. Right. And then, uh, and the penis song. Penis song, and, and then, then it goes seriously downhill for me. And then uh, I'm trying to think after the penis song, Mr. we go to Oh, oh, right, we go back to the restaurant. That's right. There's there's two restaurant seeds. Mm-hmm. I, In the very the beginning, we first see the fish. When, and when then we see them after the middle of the film, and then they're in the restaurant with Mr. Creosote. That's right. Well, you say restaurant scene in this movie, you think of Mr. Chris. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> it's yes. so like, wow. <laughs> well, that's one way of putting it. Wow. <laughs> and uh, I think I think I've got it. I think that's it. Well, we get death. Uh-huh. And then, then it's um, the execution, um, the, the, the Grim Reaper scene. Yeah. And, uh, and then... Christmas like in Chapman's heaven. Chapman's Lounge Lizard Christmas in Heaven. All right. And hilarity ensues. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Christmas in Heaven. 
Christmas <clears throat> Crimson Assurance, best part of the movie. And I totally forgot Matt Frower was in that scene. Yeah, it's like one of his first roles. I, I have in my notes his name with a question mark, and then I'm looking at the, que- the the credits, and I just deleted the question mark and replaced it with a few exclamation points. Yeah. And it's Max just himself. this great metaphor. You have these employees overthrowing their oppressive managers. And even at the beginning, the ship is treated like an old... A uh, slaver ship with you know right. the, the the lines of slaves rowing, and you have these old accountants who are kind of moving like they're rowing a big ship. So, I, I think we're in disagreement on this movie, honestly, because mm-hmm. and I love from, everything up to Mister Creosote. From beginning to end, this movie is probably the most the brutalist satire. Oh yeah, I've ever seen. <laughs> I just didn't really like anything after me as Mr. Creosote, which is admittedly like the last 15 minutes of the film, but it tanked it for me. Like the, the Mr. Creosote, I, I don't know. I, I guess we should save it to. Yeah. Let's get there. In, in time. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but Crimson Assurance, a great metaphor. Cause it's these employees throwing over, th- overthrowing their oppressive managers and mutinying, but then like taking on larger firms and being just as oppressive to them. And, you know, oh, yeah. t- destroying them. So, and just to, to know that this is before, <laughs> like, there's a New York Times article in 85. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like two years after fucking Monty Python. Mm-hmm. I mean, this was something that happened even back in the oh, 40s. Yeah, it was happening at the time. It just wasn't publicized. It, and It was just people in the business world knew about it more right. than anything yeah. else. And no pythons were in this movie, in this section, except for brief appearances from Palin and Gilliam as window I, washers. Yeah, in my notes, it's ten minutes before you see anybody from Monty Python yeah. in this movie. <laughs> it's hard not to watch this movie with 2020 vision, though. Meaning current, you know, in the current perspective. Because seeing the guys in suits jumping out of the building was a little disturbing after 911. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I didn't even think of that. Um, but I loved the anchor coming out of the sidewalk. <laughs> I mean, the effects were damn impressive for a comedy in eight, made in 83. Released it's, in 83. It seemed very Gilliam, the the Crimson Assurance scene. Mm-hmm. But I thought it, but it said it was Jones. But like the whole thing with the camera well, running Jones around directed the, ledge, the whole movie. But but that part was prop might have been you know um, subbed out to uh, Gilliam. Like the the camera going around the ledge seemed very Gilliam to me. Yeah. yeah. In fact, that whole feel had like a Twelve Monkeys kind of feel yeah, in yeah, Brazil. Yeah. Um, who did? Um, was it one of the Pythons who did Brazil? Oh, it was Gilliam. Yeah. It was Gilliam. Oh yeah, that's what it, a lot of it reminded me of. Oh yeah. Um, loved the scale difference when was they get to New York. Because you think the Crimson Assurance building is big, then they get to New York and you see it compared to these skyscrapers, and it's just tiny. Um, also, you know the song at the end. It's fun to charter an accountant and you know <laughs> sail the wide accountancy. Yes. Oh man. And there are some great transitions because we get we go from them to fish. Well, that that Gilliam cartoon in the intro, there's so many jokes in there. Like, I have to watch that at least. Uh, I haven't watched this movie enough, mm-hmm. it's clear. And, of course, I think the reasons why you don't like it are the reasons why I haven't watched it. Possibly. <laughs> like I said, it's all af- Mr. Creosote and after. Um, speaking of the beginning, though, after the film's title was chosen, Douglas Adams Yes, that Douglas Adams called Jones to tell him he had just finished a new book to be called The Meaning of a Lif, L-I-F-F. <laughs> Jones was initially concerned about the similarities, which led to the scene in the title sequence in which a tombstone is struck by lightning, which turns the meaning of lif into the meaning of life. So wait a minute, he, he was going to really call... He's talking about life, the universe, and everything, isn't he? No, it was a separate thing. I looked it up. It's a joke glossary called The Meaning of Lyft. I'm not sure what it is in reference to, but it's not Hitchhiker's Guide. I thought that too at first. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a separate thing that predates. I think it predates Hitchhiker's Guide. 
Not sure. Well, at least the novel, because obviously. Yeah, I was gonna say because the Hitchhiker's Guide, the story in general, goes on long before that goes. You know, 70s, way before yeah. That. yeah. Um, loved again the medical gag. But uh, I moving think on, the baby moving in forward. space in the cartoon was a mm-hmm. 2001 reference. Oh, okay. <laughs> I wasn't paying. It's a title sequence. I tend not to pay attention to them. I might have to look at it a bit more closely. But it's a Gilliam cartoon. So, true, true. I mean, there are just like all of these jokes and re- in references just mm. kind of moving really quickly through the whole thing. Yeah. But yeah, it's definitely worth going back yeah. over to see. But well, yeah, the birth. The, heist, the hospital sequence. These two surgeons about to deliver a kid. Who, in case an administrator shows up, they have to have all of these new equipment come in that they have no idea what it does. They get all the equipment in place, and then they realize they're missing the patient. <laughs> like I said, just fucking brilliant satire. Mm. <laughs> just, I mean, it, the patient is the last thing on their minds. Mm. And, of course, the person running the hospital, uh, a birth. What, what sort of procedure is that? <laughs> the administrator who they're trying to impress has no idea about any of it. <laughs> Extracting the baby from the tummy. <laughs> and then there's this fascinating contrast because they go from this high tech hospital to the Roman Catholics who who have like twenty Wait a minute, kids. Though. The, the 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 joke that Chapman ends the the birth scene with blew my mind Mm, what was the joke well they take the baby away you know okay everyone Mm -hmm. and they they leave the the mother alone in the room and she goes to ask Chapman is it a boy or a girl and Chapman just looks at her and says it's far too early to impose yeah. gender roles at this point. And I was mm-hmm. just like, wait, what, what the fuck? That, that, in high, I caught that too. That was way the fuck ahead of its time. Like, what? <laughs> yeah. That, that, he's like 30 years, 35 years ahead of his time. Yeah. And um, yeah, my wife was like, well, are they, was he just saying that to be absurd? And I was thinking, well, yeah, I mean, they, well, they I mean, be- it was coming out of the seventies. So, you know, in terms of gender roles, that was an issue, but it's it's Graham Chapman and, mm-hmm. and you know gender roles were pretty <laughs> prevalent on his mind. Well, yeah, Chapman was gay, so he right. gender may have been he may have been a little ahead of the curve. The gay community in general may have been a little ahead of the curve on gender than the rest of the world. Because think about it, back in in Python when he was like the Bond villain. He, you know, the, the joke was Flopsy's dead and never called me mother. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it was just a throwaway joke that he put out there. And of course, everybody was, just, was at the time, even in the 80s, was just like, holy shit, what a joke that is. Hmm. Well, that was really a kind of more of a Joan Crawford reference. Not reference, but a kind of leaning into a kind of a Joan Crawford thing. Um, but yeah, th- that was way of the head in terms of the curve in terms of gender. Um, yeah. Then they go to the Roman Catholics with like twenty kids, and the father telling their his kids that he has to sell one of them off for, or has to sell all of them off yeah, for medical he research. Yeah, sell them all off <laughs> for medical experiments. Again, just going incredibly dark, and that leads to a musical number that includes a funeral procession. Yes. And kids singing about sperm. Um, yeah, and 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 to be sensitive to the the younger actors in that scene, um, Palin actually said um, those little rubber things at the end of my sock. The word cock was dubbed in later. <laughs> but they were fine with saying sperm. Yeah, and and apparently the kids had no idea what they were talking about. Okay, well, I, I guess not. Yeah. But you it's know, he just something it, it's you would dark. never be able to make today. Mm. They say that a lot about older movies. Yeah. It's truly something they would never be able to make today. Well, we'll get to some well, other things too. Um, but talking about selling his kids to med for medical experiments, and that leading to a musical number, <laughs> and then so this long. Why did to- Jones have to play multiple r- r- roles in that number? <laughs> <laughs> he directed he probably wanted to huh. I mean 
Chapman or Cleese could have easily mm-hmm. played the priest. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but before we get to the priest, we have this long tangent about how Protestants can wear whatever sex toys and, and <laughs> whatever that they want, use any um, um, pre- uh, birth control that they want. Right. Um, loved Idol in that scene because it's this you uh, know yes. stuffy you know Protestant man talking about how he could if he wanted to wear a condom or a French decor yada yada, and his wife just like getting so excited at this possibility. Well, they only they've only had sex twice. They've established right, this, right? Yeah. You know, well, yeah. You know, what do you mean they they you know can only have it for procreation? Like we've only had it for procreation. <laughs> but as he's talking about all of these other possibilities that they could explore, she's getting so excited, right? <laughs> and and Idol just plays it perfectly. Yeah, the the acting. Uh, when Idol plays a woman in this movie, actually, uh, on mm. any occasion, yeah. it, it is just. It's perfect. He's just amazing. And then the prayer that Palin <laughs> reads. You've riffed on this on many occasions. Yes. <laughs> it's kind. Of, it's a little bit of you know of a continuation from what they did in the Grail, but uh-huh. I mean, just coming out. And yeah, saying, it's it's the holy hand grenade prayer just extended and just. Way more brutal. <laughs> and then there's this hymn about them begging God not to kill them, which says so much about religion. Oh, yeah. Totally. That, that's what it is. <laughs> and then the classroom lecture, which is the line that I always quote that I get a little bit wrong. You don't have to go leaping toward the clitoris. <laughs> I've quoted that line many year, many times over the years, and I've gotten it a little bit wrong. I usually say marching. Not stampeding. Yeah. I usually you know, twist it a little bit, but yeah, you don't have to go leaping toward the quarters. And I'm surprised you didn't want to use that for the intro line. I totally didn't think of it. It was would have been better. It was oh. one of mine. Um, oh, it was. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. It was anyway. my third choice. Yeah. Well, I mean, you had a better one. so good. Um, love that they had a fold-out bed in the classroom. Oh my the god! The blackboard just turns into this fold-out bed. Well, you have no idea where this thing is going right. when you're watching it for the first time. I don't when think you, they had any idea where it was going. Like when you're watching it again, like you see that, like that blackboard <laughs> that's there the whole time. That pull-out bed. According to Palin, the writing process was quite cumbersome. An awful lot of material didn't get used. Holy Grail had a structure, a loose one. The search for the Grail. Same with Life of Brian. With this, it wasn't so clear. In the end, we just said, what the heck? We have a lot of good material. Let's give it the loosest structure, which will be the meaning of life. There was no plan. I, it would have been tough to have shoehorned a plot into this, yeah. you know? Because you're covering everything, you right. know? Exactly. And you're, you're doing in different time periods. You're, you know. And it's just a big, expensive flying circus. Yeah, the show never had a proper send off, so I can yeah, understand. True. Um, th- then we get to the sex demonstration in class. John <laughs> Cleese and Patricia Quinn, m- m- you know, simulating sex in front of the classroom. <laughs> just, just him turning and yelling at yeah. students when, because he stopper. had an ocarina, and he, he tells him, "Bring it here." Brings, I think it was Palin. Brings it up to him. He says, "No, put it on the desk." <laughs> Put it on the desk. Don't just bring it up to me. <laughs> and then we get the rugby mat, rugby match, like, which, like you said, says it all about being in school. Yeah, just how like the teachers even out to get them yeah. to to the tune of Takada and Fugue in D minor. Yeah, oh, I, you know I should have our, our song. Our theme music is the Takata section of Takata and Fugue in D minor, um, you know, played by me on a keyboard impersonating steel drums, but originally <laughs> it was by Bach on an organ. Um, loved that. And then it transitions right into a war scene with Takata still playing. Very Pink Floyd. Oh, yeah, definitely. Like, even, even you know, the um, the musical number... For the the sperm mm-hmm. it is very Pink Floyd yeah, too. Yeah. Actually, that whole like scene when they're growing up in the uh, you know the school kids and stuff. 
But just hearing Bach's organ, or his, you know, he didn't play it, of course, but what his compo- composition on organ played over a war scene made me realize just how much, I won't say Wright whip- ripped him off, but just how Bach influenced Wright is. <laughs> Richard Wright, the keyboardist from Pink Floyd. He, he took a lot from uh, Bach. And then we get to the going, awar- going away party during the war. <laughs> It's a classic Python, but I still loved it. Yeah. It's, it's it's kind of something they've done before. It's it's sad and dark too, you know? Yeah. Oh, it is, but it's 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 very I want I want to say typical Python for them. Right. Um and you then we see have where it's going, like before they even get into it, like right. of course yeah. they're, they're there's no way they're getting off this hill right, of alive. <laughs> and then the drill sergeant. Which was a brutal shot of the military because, you know, they he's trying to get the, the squadron to do the formation. And as soon as he establishes that any of them want to go somewhere else, he's, well, then just go. <laughs> Gradually <laughs> loses everybody. And his whole point was just to march around for a bit. Like, that's the only purpose was just to march around. The, the pointlessness of just, yeah. okay, we're going to do these exercises. Mm-hmm. The middle of the film had to have been completely intentionally ripped off from Rocky Horror Picture Show. This is this is my favorite part of the film. Oh, absolutely. yeah, it's a close second for me. This is this is just fucking hilarious. Yeah. Um, Graham Chapman, I swear, is dressed up like Daryl Hannah for Blade Runner. See, I see Frankenfutter there. Think about it. The blonde hair. I get it. Yeah, I do see. Eye makeup like that. I do see it. Yeah, but it just in eighty three that uh, he's in kind of in a, in a corset and you know it it just screams um pi- or Rocky Horror to me. <laughs> and and the, the arms that that um Jones character has st- were directly used in the Tommy the Cat video. Primus took that directly. Intentionally, I'm sure. And I've always wondered if there's an actual riddle there. Like, can you figure out where the fish went? <laughs> they, they're, it was right there, isn't it? I mean, okay, it was on the plate, was, wasn't it? Oh, okay. I didn't. I wasn't paying that much attention. Um, okay, I'll have to watch that part again. Okay, that's, that's the joke, I guess. I just thought they were being absurdist. I think they're being absurdist. <laughs> The, you know, fish, of course, are like the Greek chorus kind of mm-hmm. thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, in a bowl, hanging around. Because then after Where Did the Fish Go, we get the fish in the restaurant again, talking about how great the middle of the film was. <laughs> and then we get middle age. And the characters in the middle age section just seems a little older than middle age. And keep in mind, of course, it was fish that killed the uh, the, like, the, yeah. the dinner party. Right. Of course. Which I'm surprised they didn't call back the fish yeah. for that reference. Well, I'm thinking it was, was probably like, those fish. Was that? I think it was probably those same fish. Oh, I didn't think of that. But the the two, char- the two characters in the middle age section seemed a little old to be middle aged. Granted, we're middle aged, so and they seemed older than us. So maybe that's a bit of denial on my part. But I just <laughs> it was an older a- couple out for dinner. Except the dinner was in the form of a conversation. They were they were there to have a, a um, prompted conversation. Just really taking a, the piss out of vacuous American culture, mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> or lack thereof. You know, I love pineapple. Anything with pineapple in it, and then combining just nonsense being slapped together like a luau in a medieval dungeon. And it kind of also seemed like a bit of a shot at marriage. You know, this old couple have to go out on a date and pay to have a conversation. Hmm. I don't know. You know, Maybe. as the non-married of the two of us, it kind of came off that way to me. I don't know. I I think what we saw it more of as a look at American culture, because mm-hmm. they even come back yeah, true. To you know, death takes another shot at us, of course. Yeah, right. 
And then we get to the bit that I think just went a little too dark. Live <laughs> organ transplants. Yeah, well, they, they. I mean, it was graphic, man. Yeah. <laughs> They show up at this guy's house who, who, you know, checked the box on his driver's license, is an organ donor, and they take his liver while he's alive. And of course, it's like, yeah, it's upon death. It's like, well, you're not going to survive it, of course. But we have, you know, he says, you know, he has to be killed. And, and as one of the guys who's harvesting it, who are not doctors, if that's made very clear, um, is talking to his wife about this. He says, well, he, you know, it has to be after death. You know, he can't survive it. Um, are you doing anything? And he starts hitting on his wife. Right. Well, you think he's hitting on her. Mm. But it's even worse. <laughs> yeah, it's probably the darkest thing they've ever done, really. Yeah. And I mean, that's saying a lot for Python. Right. And, I mean, and then trying to get... get the satire out of it, because yeah. what is it? You know, people who care about other people get punished like this you know i mean yeah i don't know I, that's one where i don't really get what they were saying with it i mean i think they were going back to the medical profession again and how mm -hmm. it's more of a business okay. than uh but that makes sense but i don't know i don't quite get it uh -huh. and then the galaxy song which i love <laughs> but it's kind of crowbarred in yes it is <laughs> Because after hitting on her, he just kind of... I forget, I don't even remember how they transitioned into it. But Cleese's character opens the fridge door, Idol steps out, and does the galaxy song. And then comes back and they finish the, the skit off. And the fridge door, I actually was counting, it closes in time with the music. <laughs> which is brilliant. <laughs> And then, the brief, idol. <laughs> and then the brief return of the Crimson Assurance, um, where it's it, it's just another shot at corporate America. You know? I kind of wish that it came more unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I kind of wish they had some other like work scene or something, yeah. and the Crimson Assurance came out. But yeah, I mean, let, let's be honest: the Crimson Assurance is just substituting for the Spanish Inquisition. Well, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, there's these this boardroom of, of corporate suits are talking about you know what they're what they want to own next and trying to find the next trend and one of them says people aren't wearing enough hats. That's his answer to the meaning of life, I believe, isn't well, it? And then the other and someone else says um, and he, something about he goes on this thing about how the soul you know unlike Catholics think you're not born with the soul it develops and you know it goes on this whole spiritual thing <laughs> right and then one of the other says. Let me hear more about the hats. The hats. <laughs> <laughs> and then the Crimson Insurance raids. <laughs> and then the penis song, completely out of nowhere, but always right. enjoyable. Oh, yeah. And uh, the penis song out of nowhere kind of says a lot today. <laughs> and then for me, it all went downhill very rapidly. Ah, uh, a satire on excess. Yeah, but it's just repeated vomiting. <laughs> I couldn't even watch the scene. I couldn't even look at my monitor. It's just, and it's it's also a bit fat phobic, which I have issues with. Um, you know, it's just Jones in this fat suit repeatedly vomiting into a bucket and projectile vomiting. Oh, of course. I don't know if it's it had been done before that. It just seems like gratuitous and, you know, just the excuse to be gross. Well, there's that. But I think it does sum up excess. Mm. Possibly. Um, and up for me, up until that scene, it was an easy five. Um, and then we get Arthur Jarrett's execution, which was just kind of sexist. He's chased <laughs> by a bunch of topless women. <laughs> I thought that was funny. <laughs> he well, he chose that. That was the way he chose to die. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and maybe I'm a little too sensitive about that one. Um, but then 
we have a suicide joke involving a tree, which I I'm, I'm, you know, have some issues with. The Grim Reaper bit did get a little bit better. I liked the guy trying to shoo, a, shoo away the Grim Reaper. <laughs> yes. He's the unwanted guest that yeah. comes in, takes the party down. Mm-hmm. I, I, if circumstances were different, I probably would have enjoyed that bit a bit, bit, bit more than I did. Um, but then, then I, I think, think it, yeah, it says that uh, we're we're gonna have the same petty differences and problems oh, yeah. and quirks, even in death. And everyone dies, you know. It, it's no matter who you <laughs> but are. Even, but even yeah right even after death they're still like well let's take our cars and the crew mm. people are just like what the fuck and the vortex <laughs> that death leads them into was very nicely done yeah like Gilliam outdid himself at that <laughs> it's probably his last animation mm. think about it he went out big yeah and then That's... we get Christmas in heaven Chapman as a lounge singer is singer is creepy as hell <laughs> yes he is. Oh, man. Graham Javid. But that whole bit is a bit of a mess. The whole Christmas in Heaven scene is a mess. It makes no sense. It's a complete mess. I have no idea what they're doing there with that. Like, it, it, it's always Christmas in Heaven, as I guess what they're saying. What they mm-hmm. had said, and they just get into this musical number, but what is it for? <laughs> yeah. Uh... So, like, with the possible exception of the Grim Reaper scene, which really just hit me at a bad time, you know, the last... I can't imagine why. <laughs> everything after Creosote is is, is is not is just horrible to me. <laughs> everything before Creosote is brilliant, Every except, you know, um, live organ donors or, or, you know, harvesting um, went a little too far, but I still liked it. Um, yeah. And then, at the very end, we get... Um, I think it was Idol, you know, with a book saying, here, here is the meaning of life. <laughs> and, you know, there were some good things to do, you know, be nice to people. Um, I forget what the rest of them were. But just, you know, generally good good things to do. But life really doesn't have a meaning. <laughs> In a strict sense. Well, a you meaning- know, I think... That, that what they give isn't really a meaning, is well, it? No, they were. It was just some generally good advice. I, all I can yeah. remember is be nice to people, but the rest of it was just you know, good, generally good advice, good ways to live. Yeah. But a meaning is an attempt to communicate something. You know, a lot of art has meaning. Not all art. You know, there are the Dadaists. Um, yeah. And even some Dadaists, there's there's yeah, something there's there. There's some really. meaning there, I guess. Um you know, most things that are said have meaning. A lot of things have meaning. Life, life can have purpose. Like life can have a goal and objective. You can, you know, later on ascribe it some meaning for yourself. It doesn't have an intrinsic meaning. It's just what happens. <laughs> True, and I, I think that's. Well, I guess that is the point in the end, though. Yeah. What, true. The the meaning is what you give it in right. the end. That's a good point. All right. Whether so, it's examined or whether it's, uh, mm. you know, podcasting for <laughs> a truck driver out there. Uh-huh. Um, Cleese has said that he considers the movie a bit of a cock up. The other Pythons <laughs> agreed that the movie is not of the same quality of their previous three movies. I think they're including and now for something completely different. Really? Um, yeah. Um, I obviously agree. Um, and, and now for something completely different, which just kind of like well, that's what surprised me because I can't think it? of it, it was Life of Brian Growl, this and now for something completely different. That's those are the only Python movies, right? Yeah, I think I'm, so. I'm not forgetting one, and and yeah, sound for something completely different was really just a best of. Yeah, that was so. That that's was an it is an odd thing to include. I will say, you know, obviously, Life of Brian and Growl were are better. We've already reviewed them. Yeah, you know, I'm looking up to see what what we. What we gave them? Did we give them both fives? Grell was a double five. I know that. Um, I'm sure Life of Brian was too. Uh, you'll let me know in a minute if I'm wrong. Um, also, Uh-oh. Jones spent most of the budget on every sperm is sacred. That's why it's <laughs> the greatest musical number. The That's rest funny. of the Pythons found out after the fact. 
I think you might have given it four and a half. Okay, Brian. You know, it's hard to you know I'm on the website, so mm. it's hard to yeah, uh, yeah it's hard to figure the out. Numbers. Um, I'll, <laughs> I'll I'll take a look later and maybe put it out on social media. Um, also, the find the film sketch was filmed in the main control ha- main control hall at Battersea Power Station <laughs> in London. <laughs> And was supposed to represent weird dreams everyone experiences from time to time. <laughs> Gilliam later said he regretted that it wasn't um, explained clearly. No, no. Yeah, you don't Why want to explain, explain that part. That? That's, that's what makes it great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was like one of the best, uh, right. you know, parts of the movie, hands down. Oh, yeah, I'm... It's a close second to Crimson Farming Assurance for me, but yeah, it's definitely a a highlight. Um, Sequels and remakes? Ah, what? I mean, before it got to Creosote. Yeah, um, before it got to Creosote and it tanked for me, I was thinking Wright and Peg could do it justice. Hmm. You know, if anybody is going to try to do this again. But I'd rather see Life of Brian or Meaning or, or Growl remade, if anything. I, if any Python is. I think he, I mean, you leave that one alone, you know? Yeah, you, you leave the, you leave Python alone, of course. Yeah. On the brains? On the brains, I'm trying to find what we gave uh, the ones in the past. I know, I know Growl was a double five. Um, yeah. Brian might have been differently. Um, if you get to the, you know, what should be the image on the, the on our website for that on for that episode that that entry, right click, try to save that image. It'll tell you the brains. It'll, it'll have a number next to it. Yeah, I think you gave Grail a four and a half, honestly. Oh, okay, maybe I did. Because um, I see a a point five. Okay, so maybe it was four and a half. I I forgot. Maybe maybe there was a little one little issue. This one. Um, like I said, I loved it up until Creosote, and that just tanked it. I, based on most of what happened after that, I can't recommend it. It's a, it's a three and a half. And I'm gonna, I'm definitely gonna recommend it because it's the satire. Mm-hmm. It's just, I don't know, it is five brains. I think he did okay. both. I'm, I'm, just, yeah. I'm pretty sure Growl was a double five. Yeah. And I wonder what Life of Brian was. We'll check later. What are you writing this one? I'll give it this one a four. All right. And what have we learned? That's a good thing that viruses are too small to take our legs. Mm. And I learned what assurance films firms actually do. I Googled <laughs> assurance because of this movie. <laughs> um, apparently, they're like really top level accountants who, you know, look over and ver- you know, review financial documents to make sure everything is good. You know, they're accountants accounts. You know, I don't think we've ever reviewed Life of Brian. We haven't reviewed Life of Brian. I don't I think sure we, we have. Had. Damn, we need to. I did a Google search, or, you know, I did a search in, hmm. in the movie list of for life, and it only has Resident Evil Afterlife and The okay. Meaning of Life. Huh. I was sure we, we reviewed Life of Brian. I'll take a look. Um, all right, that's it for The Meaning of Life. Until next time, we'll be reviewing Edmund. This is our Stuart Gordon tribute. Um, Based on a David Mamet play, but from what I've read of the plot summary, very much in our wheelhouse. Um, Until then, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you are. There you are.